Hello and welcome to Ion Africa. I'm Clarice Fortuné. Our top stories today. Still no end in sight to the war in Sudan after a first round of talks in Jeddah. The warring parties reiterated instead commitment to improve access to humanitarian aid. Civil organizations in Niger are now taking on France's economic interests and want an uranium extraction project to be cancelled. African women in science, they're now being recognized for their research on finding long-lasting solutions to the continent's diverse challenges. The first round of negotiations ended in Jeddah between the Rapid Support Forces and the Sudanese army. The meeting has so far been able to reach, a, has not been able to reach a ceasefire in Sudan, although the two warring parties committed to facilitate humanitarian aid. In Nairobi, Bastien Renouille. In a communique, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, said that the Rapid Support Forces and the Sudanese military agreed to participate in a multilateral uh, humanitarian uh, forum led by the United Nations to find solutions to obstacles uh, faced by the uh, NGOs and humanitarian workers in Sudan who are trying to assist uh, civilians. According to the communique, they also agreed to create a communication mechanism between the two parties. But uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia Arabia said that negotiators were disappointed because uh, both the Rapid Support Forces and the Sudanese military uh, did not uh, agree to organize a ceasefire. And I can tell you that among the uh, political analysts, both from Sudan and uh, international um, I've been able to speak to during the past weeks, uh, nobody believed that it was possible to reach a ceasefire. It was even more impossible given the intensity of the fighting of the past weeks and of the past days, especially in the Darfur region, where the Rapid Support Forces took over several military bases in the cities of El Fashir, Niala, Nertiti, or in El Genina, the capital of West Darfur. In El Genina, as soon as they took over a military base, thousands of refugees flocked in neighboring Sudan, and they said that uh, the Rapid Support Forces killed hundreds of civilians. I've seen videos of uh, civilians, uh, young men, uh, sitting on the ground being beaten by the Rapid Support Forces. I've seen pictures of dozens of bodies uh, laying in the streets wearing civilian clothes. So it's very difficult to believe that uh, the Rapid Support Forces will uh, commit to what they say and that they're really willing to protect civilians. In Niger, the M62 is a group of civil organizations opposed to the French military presence in a country. It is now taking on France's economic interests and wants the mining permit for an uranium extraction project to be cancelled. Here's the story. Once known as Areva, Orano has been mining uranium in Niger to power French nuclear plants for over 50 years. From 2005 to 2020, Niger ranked as the third largest source of natural uranium for France, providing 19% of its supply. Yet some in civil society want Orano's permit revoked for their upcoming uranium project, the Imoire and Mine. They argue the permit's no longer valid. Orano disagrees. The permit is unlawfully held by Orano. In 2009, Areva obtained this mining permit through a mining agreement, under which they had an obligation to produce results, meaning to start operations within three years. The project's on hold. Because of low uranium prices, the French company found operating costs too high. But tensions between Orano and civil society have deeper roots than just Imo Aren. In 2021, the Kuminak mine and Oano subsidiary in Arlit shut down. Two years later, the workers' union filed a lawsuit claiming that post-dismissal support wasn't provided as promised. The Kuminak management denies these claims, yet the union believes Oano cannot exit Niger without some explaining to do. Orano has a lot of interests here. I don't think they want to leave. Even if Orano stops today, there's Kominak here. In any case, Kominak has commitments. They must restore the site they've mined for 49 years to its original state. Amid the ongoing political crisis, Orano's oil processing operations in Niger took a major hit. However, when we reached out to the group, they stated not to be affected by the current events. The current events in Niger have no impact on Orano's ability to fulfill its contracts with international clients. Sommer and Kamenax management responds to requests and inspections from the supervising ministry representatives. 
Meanwhile, the military authorities in Niamey have not questioned the presence of the French company on Niger soil. Congolese opponent Cherubin Okende was found dead last July in his vehicle. Today, the family filed a complaint against Major General Christian Dewell in Belgium. The family's lawyer, Alexis Desoif, said there's enough evidence of guilt against the head of military intelligence, who he says has Belgian nationality. An investigation procedure is still on the way in Kinshasa. Now, every year, women in science are rewarded by the Foundation UNESCO L'Oréal. For this edition, 30 young African researchers have been selected from a pool where only 2.5% of the world's researchers are in the continent. Among them, Marie Amoako from Ghana. Her specialty, nutrition and dietetics. She's researching how diets and nutrition influence the possibility of babies developing clefts a facial malformation. Thank you very much, Mary, for joining us. So your subject is very interesting. Please tell us more about your research. Okay, thank you very much for having me. Um, so I am working with children to know how maternal preconceptional diets, that's um, diets of women before pregnancy, affects um, birth outcomes. And also whether women who have folic acid um, utilization problems. Um, so basically, I want to improve upon per, um, co conceptional nutrition diets um, before pregnancy, as well as um, improve diet in pregnant women in general. And so what kind of impact do you think your research will have? So the impact of my research will be to improve the diets of mothers before pregnancy then also um, improve them, the outcomes, the birth outcomes, such as improving, um, you know, that um, our facial cleft or cleft lift palate can contribute to um, neonatal mortality. So as we are reducing clefts, we are reducing neonatal mortality. We are also improving cognition in children because our facial clefts can contribute to um, cognitive deficits in children. So um, basically, these are the two impacts. And we are also looking at improving reproductive health among women with dietary approaches in Ghana. But it's not, it's not only the only uh, topic that we've been researching for. What are your other area of research? Oh, OK. So um, I work. So basically, I am working to optimize human development looking at childhood development at this stage. So I am working in northern Ghana at the moment to improve diets of children, diets of children to improve linear growth, cognition, and also vision in children in northern Ghana. So currently I'm working on a complementary feeding product to be used for nutrition intervention. So you're involved in many projects. How do you get finance for all these projects? Oh, okay. So um, I'm usually funded by a number of funding agencies. Currently, apart from Laurel UNESCO, I am funded by Organization for Women in Developing World, trying to, um, they, are, they are funding me for the complementary feed, um, food research. So I have a number of um, non-governmental organizations who fund the research. With me. So we would like to know a bit more about yourself. So how did you get into science in the first place? Oh, okay. So I grew up in a family of scientists. So my father is a mechanical engineer, and I have my brothers studying various fields of science, medical doctor, pharmacist, engineers. So we started, I started developing the interest for science right from childhood, right at home, because of the conversations and all the challenges that were being thrown at me. And my <laughs> brothers can be competitive with their studies. So that was where my passion for science began, right from home. Do you remember what it was your first project? Um, first project, yes. My first undergraduate research was um, finding out the causes of maternal mortality in Ghana. And that was, when, that was what actually triggered my interest in nutrition because during the research, I found out that majority of the women who died, died of um, hemorrhage. And most of the, those who died of hemorrhage were anemic. So then I was just thinking, that okay, maybe there is something wrong with their diet. So let me go into nutrition in order to do something impactful to help women, pregnant women. So that was where my interest in nutrition started. So as you said earlier, only 2.5% of the world's researchers are on the continent. What kind of challenges do you think you, you have found so far? 
Um, um, come again. I, I didn't hear what, that. What challenges do you have, do, have you experienced so far working in research in Africa? Yes. So cha one of my major challenges have been transitioning from doctor, uh, doctorate student who has graduated into a lecturer, into a full-blown researcher, because in my university there are no... Um, opportunities for you to transition smoothly from being a doctoral student to um, being a researcher. So um, it was a challenge, but with the help of um, funding agencies, I've been able to set up my lab doing all this research. So it's been good so far. So um, sometimes you don't have the opportunities to, and sometimes the mentorship to transition from being a post after, after your doctoral to become a postdoctoral researcher and also to become a lecturer, it's challenging. Thank you very much, Mary. We're looking forward to get your findings very soon. Thank you and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. And Thank well, uh, that's it for this edition. Thank you for watching Eye on Africa. More news coming up.